The two blocks shown are originally at rest, neglecting the masses of the pulleys and the effect of friction in the pulleys and assuming that the coefficient of friction between block A and the horizontal surface are mu s.25 and mu k.20 determine the acceleration of each block and the tension in the cable. All right, so a lot of new stuff here. Uh, we're back to the pulley system. No, this is the same pulley system we tackled on week three. So if you haven't looked at that yet, have a look, make sure you're comfortable with that because we are adding extra layers of difficulties now. The first layer is the introduction of the idea of forces. So now we're interested in the tension, um, normal forces, weight, and all of that. And the second addition is friction, right? So we're actually looking into friction, not friction of the whole system. That is, we're ignoring friction here on the pulleys, but we're looking at friction here between the horizontal surface and block A. All right, so the two blocks are originally at rest. So this is quite important, something we don't want to overlook. Because if they're at rest, it means two things, right? Two things. First thing is that our V0 is zero, right? So I could have gone down a bit further. It means that our V0 is zero for both block A and B. The second thing is that when accounting for friction, I'll be looking at mu s, and this stands for mu static, right? So it's the coefficient, the friction coefficient for a static system, as opposed to mu k, which is for the uh, kinematic one, so that means that we actually have movement happening. Okay, so if this block is at rest, then this is the coefficient that we're interested in. If it, the whole thing starts to move, then this is the coefficient we're interested in. Okay, so don't disregard that. The system is originally at rest. It's quite important information for us. We're neglect ne neglecting the mass of the pulleys and the effect of friction between the pulleys. Neglecting the mass of the pulleys is quite important because that means that we can say the tensions in every single point of the line are the same, right? Because of this, if we're neglecting the mass, this is zero, then that means that the force at this point here or this point here, this point here, the tension force is the same throughout the whole thing. Okay, what else? Um, we need to determine the acceleration of each block and the tension of the cable. So to be able to do that, the first thing we need to figure out is, will this guy move or not? Because let's look at the whole thing here. Okay, so we have that big block there, B, and we know that that block has is wants to go down, right? It has a, its weight pulling it down. And if it goes down, if it eventually goes down, then it's going to pull down this cable here, and this cable is going to pull down this way here, which is going to pull down this way here, which is going to pull right, rightwards there. If that's the case, then this guy would move rightwards, and this guy would move downwards. And then they will both have an acceleration as this guy goes um, from zero to whatever velocity it acquires. Okay, but what is trying to stop this movement? The thing that's trying to stop this movement is the friction between the ground, the horizontal surface, and block A. Right, so we have a opposing force, force of friction, friction on A, and that guy is opposing, trying to oppose this movement from the weight of B that creates the tension here. So if this friction is greater than the tension, then the system will not move whatsoever. It's going to stay there, stay still. If it's not sufficient, then it will move like we just said. So the first thing we want to do is find out whether it's going to move or not. Okay, so let's isolate these blocks, do a free body diagram on each of them, just to be aware of all the forces that are acting on them. Let's start with block B. So block B has the weight, so W of B, weight of B, right? That's the force pulling it down. And trying to hold it up, we have three forces. So we have this tension here, which is trying to hold it up. And note that we also have this pulley here. And this pulley has two ropes. It's the same rope, but you know what I mean, right? So there's actually three forces trying to oppose this movement from B, or holding B up, if you if you will. Okay, so we can write that down as one, two, three, and I'm going to call that T for tension. Okay, the cool thing is that because we can neglect the mass, like we just talked about, because we're neglecting the mass of the rope, then the tension of the rope is the same regardless of where we are. So these are all T, so we can write this as actually three times T, or three T. Okay, so that, that's block B. What about block A? Let's go on block A now. So on block A, what do we have? On block A, we have the weight of block A, just like B, so according to its mass. Because block A is on the surface, it's right here. Because it's on the surface and it's not going down into the surface, it has an opposing force, right, according to Newton's third law. And that's what we call normal force, which is perpendicular or normal to the surface. And then we have the tension there, trying to take it um, to the right, that's due to the weight of B. And like we said, we have the opposing friction there, trying to stop this motion, trying to stop this tension. So if we put down all the forces, we have normal opposing uh, the weight, we have the tension here, and we have the friction opposing the tension. So I'll just put FA for friction of A. We happen to know these uh, weights, right? Because we know the B, uh, we know its mass, so we know which is mass times gravity, and because we know the mass on B, which is 25. We can multiply that by 9.81 because we're on Earth, presumably. So we can grab the force that's trying to pull the whole thing down. And that's 245.25 newtons. And likewise, we can do the same thing for A, A for A, because we know the mass of A. It's three, I think. Um, 30, sorry, 30. So the 30 mass on A times the 9.81, which gives us a weight of 294.3 newtons. And just like before, what we're going to do now is we're going to look 
into creating a system with vectors. Let me get rid of these. With vectors, so as to facilitate our um, system, right? So remember that on the previous one, I chose this point here. The same problem when we were ignoring the friction model. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing. And remember that I created some vectors, created vectors that went from the pulley all the way to the block. So this I call XA, which is a measurement. It's a vector that measures the distance from the pulley all the way to block A. Likewise, we created a vector that leaves the system I created, the point of reference, I should say, and goes down to B. So that's YB. And if you guys recall, what we did on the previous problem is that we said that because the length of this cable here, or this rope, is a constant, it's not stretching, then that means that if I sum up the vector xA and three times the vector yb, that is one, two, three, so three times yb, I'm going to get a constant, constant being the length of the rope, right? And we also talked about this extra bit here and how if this extra bit is two meters or four meters or whatever that distance is, then we can sum that in anyhow, so it doesn't matter if four meters, this is still true, right? This is still a constant. Okay, and then we can derive this in respect to time. We're going to get the velocity of A plus three times the velocity of B has to be zero. And likewise, we can derive one more time. We're going to get the acceleration of A plus three times the acceleration of B has to be zero. And this is all from the previous problem. Cool. So what do we do now? Well, now we try to come up with equations or create a system of equations so that we can solve this problem and figure out what's going on. Okay, and the idea is if the system is at rest, okay, we can calculate what is the friction the friction when the whole thing is static. And then we can see, okay, this is the friction when everything is static, and then we can see, but what's going to, what is the actual tension that is pulling down here? And if this tension here is greater than the friction, then we know the system is going to move. If it's smaller than the friction, then it's not going to move, right? So let's find out these things so we can come to a conclusion to what's going to happen, and then with that conclusion, we can move on to find the accelerations that we're looking for and uh, the tension on the rope, okay? If we look only at the vertical forces here, so if I sum up all the forces on the y-axis, what we get? We get that 3b, right, the tension that's pulling upwards, minus weight of b have to be zero, okay, if the system's at rest, if at rest, right? So if that's the case, then it means that 3b has to be equal to zero. If it's not at rest, and we don't know if it's a thing going to keep going or not, then we know that the sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. Right, because that's Newton's second law. Force equals mass times acceleration. So the sum of forces on the y direction has to be mass of b times acceleration for b. And that's how we're going to relate these, relate these, this acceleration and these forces. Um, now, if it's at rest, again, thinking about the at rest idea, if it's at rest, looking at block A, then the weight of normal minus the weight of A has to be zero, right? And therefore, normal equals weight of A, right? And if it's at rest, that means that the friction force is either equal or greater, oops, that was wrong, is either greater or equal than the tension, right? So let's find out what is the friction force and the static friction force. Friction, uh, static, the friction for A static, if yes, will be the normal force times the coefficient for static. And the normal force in this case equals the weight of A, and the weight of A is, well, actually, let me just correct one thing that I said. Block A is not going to move up or down, right, regardless of whether this block moves left or right. So this always holds true, regardless of if it's the system is static or not, because it's not going to go up or down. And so if we look on the y direction, this always holds true. Okay, back to this. Um, fract friction for A static, so that's going to be the weight of A times the coefficient static. And that is, what's the coefficient again? 0 0.25. So it's 294.3 times 0.25. So this equals 73.57. Okay, so this is a force trying to oppose the whole movement. If we find out that the tension on A is equal to this, or smaller than this, then the system's not going to move. Right? If the tension, however, is greater than this, then it will move. Okay, so how can we find out whether what, what's going to happen? Well, we go back to the idea that if the whole thing is at rest, then the weight of B has to be equal to 3 times T, and therefore T is simply the weight of B divided by three, right? Since we know the weight of B, where is the weight of B? Here it is, 245. This is just 245.25 divided by three, which gives us 81.75. Okay, so this is the comparison we're doing now. Right, let's go, let's grab this. We 
there's a tug of war between between the tension and the friction. Okay, the friction is pulling leftwards, not pulling leftwards, opposing the force of tension with 73 newtons, and the tension has 81.75 newtons. So what happens? This guy wins, right? And if this guy wins, what happens? We get motion, and we're going to get a velocity that way, an acceleration that way. The other thing that happens, right? Another conclusion that we come to, and this is quite important, and we need to remember, is that if it moves, right? The moment it moves, and we're going to put a star here. The moment it moves, then F A S is no longer uh, welcome, right? Because it's not a static anymore. So we need to look into using F A K magnetically, because now we have movement, so we can have to use the proper coefficients. Okay. So now we go back to our uh, equation, system of equation, and we put into use the knowledge that we have just found that this guy is going to move to be able to calculate the acceleration and to be able to calculate the tension on the cable. So let's just write down. Okay? So we know block A is moving left and right, so let's, let's quickly write down what's going on. On A, the movement is happening leftwards, right? And we have tension pulling it rightwards, and we have the friction kinetic friction pulling it backwards. At the same time, we have B, and B is moving downwards, right? So we have weight of B pulling it downwards, and we have three tension, so three T, three tension, trying to hold back this movement. Okay, so now what we do is we apply Newton's second law to the situation, okay? So therefore, uh, the sum of forces in X has to equal mass of A times acceleration of A, and the sum of forces in X, we have T on the right and FAK on the left. So we have FAK minus T equals mass of A times acceleration. Just one quick note. Note that I'm, I'm, I left the T as a negative, and the reason for that is because when I created that vector, remember this vector here, this XA here? I created it to leaving the pulley and going there, so this is my positive direction. Likewise, my positive direction is downwards. So down and left are my positives once I created this system here. Okay, so back to this, so that's why that guy's negative. Over here, what's gonna be my positive? Like I just said, it will be the weight, right? So the force downwards. So weight of B minus three T has to be equal to mass of B times acceleration of B. Okay, we need a third equation because we have one more unknown, and that equation is the one that we derived right at the beginning, which says that the acceleration of A plus three times the acceleration of B has to be zero. Okay, so let's look at some unknowns. What are the unknowns on these three equations here? We uh, don't know the tension, so T for tension, it's the same unknown over here. We don't know acceleration of A, acceleration of V, acceleration of A, acceleration of V. Mass of A we know, the weight of B we know, the um, friction force we know, right, because it's the normal times the coefficient that we know. So we can use this and solve this, all right? So let's go ahead and solve this. Let me just put down the three equations here. So acceleration of A has to be equal to negative three acceleration of B, weight of B minus three times T has to be equal to the mass of B, acceleration of B, and the friction on A, the kinetic one, minus the tension has to be equal to the mass of A times the acceleration of A. So I'm going to call these guys one, two, three, and we have three equations, three unknowns. We're good to solve this. Let's do it. I'm going to start by doing equation one and three, All right? So put equation one and three, which is going to give me the friction force minus T has to be equal to the mass of A minus three acceleration of B. Okay, now I'm gonna put equation two on this one here, and that's gonna give me, okay. So that's gonna give me T equals weight of B uh, minus mass of B, AB, and divided by three. All right, so this is just equation two. I'm just rewrote it, solving for T. And now where I have T over here, I'm gonna sub in, where I have T, I'm gonna sub in that guy there. Okay, so that's gonna give me the friction on A minus weight of B plus mass of B, acceleration of B, divided by three, go to the right here, has to be equal to the mass of A that multiplies minus A, B. Cool, so that means that the mass of B, acceleration of B, plus nine times mass of A, acceleration of B, Oops, mass of A acceleration of B has to be equal to the weight of B minus the friction on A. And we can do one step further, so the acceleration of B is multiplying both of them, so we can say just mass of B plus nine times mass of A has to be equal to the weight of B minus minus three times F of A. What's happened to the three times, three times F of A? That means that acceleration of B has to be equal to the weight of B minus three times friction on A divided by the mass of A 
plus nine times mass of b, sorry, so b times mass of a. Whew, okay, so now we can sub in what we know. We know that this is 25 times gravity, 9.81. We had the value already, right? We didn't have to do this again. This is three times the normal force, and the normal force is the 0.2 this time. You highlight that, don't forget. Times the, uh, sorry, the coefficient 0.2 in the normal force is the mass of a times gravity. And then the mass of a did not change. That's, uh, what was it, 25 or something? 25. Mass of v did not change to 5, and then 9 times the mass of a, which is 30. Okay, so we only have constants here. Acceleration of b is 0.23278. Just leave it as um, 3. Let's just leave it as that. Okay, and know that we got a positive number. Okay, this is a positive number. If it's a positive number, remember that my positive is downwards. So this means that the acceleration of b is downwards, which obviously makes sense because we know that the whole thing is moving because b has a weight that's pulling it downwards. Once we have this, then everything else is easy, right? Because remember that the acceleration of a is simply equal to minus 3 times acceleration of b. So therefore, the acceleration of a equals minus 3 times what we just found, 0.233. Um, and this is just negative 0 0.698, approximately, again. Okay, negative value. If it's negative, perfect, because it completely goes along with what we knew was going to happen. So that means it's rightwards, because we said leftwards was positive. And finally, and this is the last piece of the puzzle, because remember, this is our, these are our answers, right? So this is one part of the answer. This is another part of the answer. And the last bit was attention, which is the last thing, the last unknown. Where is my tension equation? Here it is. This is the tension. So therefore, um, rate of B mass of E. So this is just mass of B times gravity minus AB divided by 3. Now that we have AB, this is trivial, and this is 79.8 newtons. Brilliant. Got it. Now, one thing to be aware of, okay, before we finish off, is that this, this tension here that we just found, right, it's different from the tension we found before, okay? This is 79.8, and remember that before we found it to be, where is it, 81, right? And the difference is due to the fact that this guy is moving now. Remember that this friction force changed right, the moment that we, the whole thing started to move, the coefficient changes, okay, so the tension is also smaller. So remember that if you were to plug in the 81 that we found before, that would be incorrect, because now we have a new tension, that's the tension 79.8. Likewise, if you forgot to take into account the static coefficient in the beginning, you could have gotten uh, 79, which is very close to the value that we got for the friction force, 73. So you wouldn't go wrong in this situation, but say this was um, 72, right, instead of the 81, then you could conclude that this is not going to move incorrectly because you're using the kinematic coefficient instead of the static one. Okay, so pay attention with that. That's something that gets a lot of people. If you have questions, let me know.